Hi, good day. Welcome back to our class, Chemistry 100B Laboratory. Today, we are going to perform the next activity on the common laboratory operations. Now, what I would like you to do is you are going to make a keen observation of the activities and procedures that I'm going to perform today because this will serve as our pre-lab lecture as well as a demo on the common laboratory operations. So the first laboratory operation that we're going to do is, if you're going to look at your lab guide, it is measuring the volume of liquids. Now, in measuring the volume of the liquids, we're going to use a graduated cylinder to measure the volume of liquids. If you're going to look at this graduated cylinder, by the way, here is what we call a collar. This collar serves as a protection of the graduated cylinder in order not to be broken when it falls, like this. That's the purpose of the collar, the graduated cylinder. Now because the first procedure is you are going to measure the volume of liquid inside a test tube. Say for example, we are going to measure the volume of the liquid that this test tube can accommodate. Take note, I place the water up to the brim. Then measure this amount of water in this test tube using the graduated cylinder. To make sure that the water will not be spilled out, you use the funnel. When you're going to look at the volume of the liquid, you have to focus your eye on the lower meniscus of the liquid. By the way, because this is only water, we are going to look at the lower meniscus of the volume reading. However, if this were mercury, then we are going to look at the upper meniscus of the liquid. In this case, the volume reading is 17 ml. Then we're going to measure the volume of liquid that this Erlenmeyer flask can contain. So let us fill this Erlenmeyer flask with water. See to it that you're going to use a funnel in order not to spill the liquid. So, fill it up to the brim. Take note that this toilet mayor is marked 50 ml. However, our graduated cylinder is only marked 25 ml. So, what are you going to do? You are going to measure the liquid inside this flask in two bases. First, you are going to pour the liquid up to the 25 ml mark. Okay, slowly. Okay. 
So you have here the volume of liquid contained in the graduated cylinder is 25 ml. Since there is still the remaining volume of liquid inside the Erlenmeyer flask, let us pour this remaining liquid onto the graduated cylinder. See to it that it reaches the mark 25. See to it that the lower meniscus reaches the mark 25 ml. So here is another 25 ml volume of liquid. A while ago, we have already placed 25 ml into this beaker. And the second time, second time, huh? and for the second time of measuring the remaining volume of liquid inside this flask, we have another 25 ml, so there is a total now of 50 ml. However, there is still a remaining amount of water inside the Erlenmeyer flask, so we have to continue measuring it. Remember, we have already uh, 50 ml that we have measured a while ago. This time, if you're going to look at the lower meniscus of the liquid level, it reaches up to the 23 ml mark. So, the volume of liquid that this Erlenmeyer can contain is 25 plus 25 plus 23 will give us 73 ml. So, that means this Erlenmeyer flask when filled with water up to the brim, can contain 73 ml of water. So that is how to measure liquids using the graduated cylinder. In your lab guide, there is a table there for you to fill in. So kindly fill in the data, which I have discussed with you. You have there the volume of the test tube, that it contains, then the volume of the Erlenmeyer flask that it contains, then convert that unit from the ML to liters. The next procedure is on the measuring of mass. In this procedure, we are going to measure the mass of the table salt. And because we are going to measure the mass, we are going to use a balance or the triple beam balance. This is the triple beam balance. If you're going to look at the construction of the triple beam balance, there are three beams in which the riders are to be placed for you to determine the specific weight or mass of the substance. So that's why this is called triple beam because there are three beams into which the riders are placed. Now before you are going to use the triple beam balance, you have to see to it that the pointer points to the zero mark. So you have to adjust all these riders here. See to it that the pointer points to the zero mark. And the pan should be cleaned. Make sure. Now, because when you're going to weigh onto the pan, do not place directly the substance onto the pan. Suppose we're going to weigh this amount of salt or table salt into this triple beam balance. Now, do not place this table salt directly onto the pan because it might cause corrosion. So what are you going to do? You are going to weigh first this watch glass. 
take the mass of that watch glass by adjusting the riders. So, if you're going to take note of the mass of this watch glass, it reads 32.5 grams. So, the empty watch glass weighs 32.5 grams. This time, we are going to place this table salt onto the watch glass. So for sure, we expect that the weight now becomes greater. Okay, so we, so we have to adjust the riders. In this case, so if you're going to look at the reading, it is marked 45 grams. So, the mass of the table salt, therefore, will be the difference between the mass of the watch glass with the table salt minus the mass of the empty watch glass. So that is how to measure the mass of substances. Let's go to the third procedure. Transferring of liquids. When you are going to transfer a liquid from one vessel to the other, in the absence of a funnel, you can use a steering rod. So in this case, suppose you are going to transfer a liquid from the beaker to the Erlenmeyer flask. Take note, the Erlenmeyer flask has a small mouth. When the beaker has a bigger mouth, of course, provided with a lip. Now, in transferring this liquid from the beaker to the Erlenmeyer flask, you use this steering rod in the absence of a funnel. See to it that the tip of the glass rod or steering rod will rest on the side of the Erlenmeyer flask without touching the mouth of the Erlenmeyer flask. So you pour slowly the liquid down the glass rod this way. So you have transferred the liquid from the beaker to the Erlenmeyer flask using a steering rod. The next procedure is heating liquids inside a test tube. Now, in heating the liquids inside the test tube, you are going to heat the upper part of the liquid first rather than the bottom part in order to prevent spurting out of the liquid. Then position the test tube at 45 degree angle with the flame and let it pass through the Bunsen flame back and forth with the open end pointed towards nobody. So do it this way. Hit the upper part of the liquid, making sure that you're not hitting the empty part of the test tube. Then once it starts to simmer, bring it back and forth over the flame. Take note, it starts to simmer now, so bring it back and forth over the flame. So this is how to heat liquids inside the test tube. Next is the precipitation process. Now, precipitation is actually the formation of a solid between two reacting substances. In our case, we are going to react the silver nitrate with the sodium chloride solution. 
Now, this is how precipitation is done. We are going to react these two substances by mixing them into this test tube. So I have here the sodium chloride solution and the silver nitrate solution. So I'm going to place first the sodium chloride onto this test tube. And I'm going to add the silver nitrate solution. Take note. So we have formed a white solid. This solid is known as the precipitate. To be exact, this is a product between sodium chloride and silver nitrate. Therefore, the solid that is formed is chemically known as silver chloride. Now, take note that you have formed here a white precipitate, but we are not sure if all the chlorides have been precipitated out. So we have to add more of the sodium chloride until no more further precipitation occurs. So to make sure that all the silver chloride has been precipitated out. So in this case, since no more further precipitation has been observed, so let us let this mixture settle. The next procedure is filtration. Now in filtration, we are going to use here the filter paper together with the funnel. So here is a filter paper. How do you use the filter paper? You are going to fold this filter paper diagonally this way. Then, fold it again diagonally this way. Open it. Take note that you have when you open it, you'll notice or observe that there is one side to have one sheet or one side only, while the other, one, the other side has three sheets. So this side, having the three sheets, cut a little at the corner this way. What is the purpose of cutting? that small portion that is to prevent the filter paper from protruding out the funnel. Before you are going to place it into the funnel, see to it that this filter paper is wet. Okay. So this is a setup for the filtration process. Now, with that precipitation process a while ago, we have already let the precipitate settle at the bottom. Then let us pour this into the filter paper placed under the funnel. To be safe, we are going to use a stealing rod into which this liquid will be poured carefully onto the funnel. Please observe that 
there is a liquid that drips down from the funnel to the beaker. That liquid that passes through the filter paper is what we call the filtrate. Now this is a process called filtration and filtration is a separation of solid from liquid using a filter paper. If we're going to open the filter paper, you can see here the precipitate deposited. If you're going to open the filter paper, you can see here the white solid or the grayish white solid, which is the precipitate. Now, with this test tube, let us scoop out this precipitate from the filter paper and place it inside this test tube. Out this solid from the filter paper into this test tube. And we will add this with water. Making sure that all the precipitates will be taken from the mouth of this test tube down the bottom of the test tube. And we will let this precipitate settle at the bottom. For the next procedure, we are going to perform the decantation process. Now, decantation is a process of separating a solid from the liquid by carefully pouring the supernatant. The supernatant is a liquid that is being poured off. When we are going to separate a solid from a liquid by pouring the mixture slowly. So do it this way. Test the mixture. Take note that you have the liquid at the upper part, a clear liquid at the upper part, and you have the solid settling at the bottom. So let us separate these two by carefully and slowly pouring off the liquid. So we have here the solid left in the test tube, while we have here the liquid that is being poured off, and this is called the supernatant. So the process of decantation is again the separation of a solid from a liquid by carefully pouring the supernatant off. Then the last operation is evaporation. Now in evaporation, we need to have the Bunsen flame, of course. So this is the setup for evaporation. Now we have here the wire gauze, which is placed onto the iron ring, supported by the iron stand. And we have the Bunsen burner underneath with a flame. A while ago, we were separating the solid from the liquid through filtration. And the filtrate that we have collected here is what we are going to evaporate off. Take note that this liquid is colorless. Now, a while ago, we were reacting the silver nitrate with sodium chloride. 
So the solid form was the silver chloride, while the liquid is the sodium nitrate. So we expect that this liquid is sodium nitrate. Let us evaporate this solution of the sodium nitrate in order to see its residue. So we will place the sodium nitrate solution into the evaporating dish. We will evaporate it to dryness, but we have to see to it that the crystals will not be destroyed. So this is how evaporation process is. Evaporation is a process of separating a solid from a liquid by evaporating of the liquid, leaving behind the solid which is called the residue. So those are all the common laboratory operations which we are commonly doing inside the laboratory. What I would like you to do is to write all the observations that you have made while well, I was demonstrating all these operations here on my table. Answer also all those questions given in the lab guide. Please submit your output on Friday through the email which I gave you last time. That would be all for today. This is your teacher, Professor Mesitas Ruiz of Holy Name University.